All right, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 6 today. And uh, we've had quite the journey so far, right? We're going to be talking about who will you serve. We're always serving somebody, whether we realize it or not. Uh, and we're going to dig into that. Uh, so far in, in chapter 1 of Romans, we took a look at the power of God and the wickedness that we possess without him. In this downward spiral that change, it starts with our thinking and our feeling and then our actions. And we become, without Christ, we really become debased, as the Bible says, where right is wrong and wrong is right. It's just completely upside down. And so that's, that was chapter one. Chapter two talks about how there's no partiality with God. There's no secret in with him. There's no grandfathering into the kingdom. It's an individual basis, individual decisions. Um, chapter 3 talks about how all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, of course. We're not good enough, right? It, it's not a works-based system. Christianity is completely different, and the playing field is level. We all are doomed. <laughs> we all need a Savior. Your good is not, a good, is not good enough, and you don't get there 75% of the way, and Jesus gives you the extra 25%. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> we're all just, we all just bring debt to the table, and he clears it, right? Chapter 4 talks about the power of faith and how we have access to his promises, which is awesome. The promises of God available to us through faith in him. And then uh, last chapter, we talked about the blessings of God that we have in him, even in our conflicts. There's blessings even in the conflicts, right? Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5 talk about this character that we can have, one of hope, right? As long as we persevere through the trials, though. And that's the first part of chapter 5, and we got into uh, being reconciled. That was our big message from last week, being reconciled through Christ, and that where sin abounds, because God knows our heart, our, our thoughts. He knows the intents behind, like, even the, the intent behind it, the, 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 even the deep, dark recesses of our heart. He knows all that. He knows all your dirty, rotten secrets. He knows you better than you know you. And uh, for a lot of us at certain times, it's not pretty. Um, but where sin abounds, the Bible says that grace abounds much more, even more, abounds much more. I like that. We talked about the analogy of an ocean, and that's like, if you look at God's grace, like his grace is like an ocean that just washes over you. You know, you're never going to fill it, you know, um, never runs out. So that's good news, and we're going to look, continuing through our journey in Romans. You guys like it so far? This is a good book, right? It's meaty. Yeah, I see some nods anyway. All right, good. Wake up. It's good. It's good. Stay engaged. Uh, if you're joining us online, hello, good to have you here with us. You can always ask questions. I will um, type those in. Jeremy will make sure that we, he relays that to me. And I'll have a number on the screen here shortly, and you can text your numbers in, and we'll answer those along the way or at the end. Um, you can always test to see, like, hey, is this phone silenced? Did you do a good job? Did the pastor silence his phone like he should? Anyway. Yeah. Question for you guys. What are some ways that not following God can produce hardship and pain? What are some ways that not following him might produce hardship and pain? Regret. Regret. First time for everything. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the end. <laughs> huh? Illness, sickness, absolutely. Sometimes our, I would say this, our choices, right? The choices that we make carry a consequence sometimes, right? As we pursue, for example, let's say um, a life of just partying, right? So you're out, you know, you're clubbing it up. You're out to, you're out at bars, you know. Then there's, you're going to have, you might lose your, end up losing your job. You might end up, you know, being addicted, right? With, you might lose your liver. It might be health issues, right? Friendship issues, relationship issues, right? Like there's a there's a path that ends up happening, right? Sometimes it's mental, emotional, right? Yeah. Depression. Depression, absolutely, right? Matthew. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you forfeit, pe you forfeit peace. You've given that away, you know. Sometimes there's a facade, though, right? Like, you know, I remember w you know, when I was out 
partying. Like it was like there's a facade of like community and the closeness and the buds and say, hanging out, but it wasn't. It, it was not as deep. <laughs> and when those relationships got tested, they they, they really fell apart <laughs> for me anyway. But um, anywho, yeah. So we're yeah. In the, in, up, absolutely end up leading in, in, into bondage, um, and really, like that's that's a that's a big thing, right? Like questioning ourselves: where does this path, this thought process, this philosophy, this these actions uh, that I'm taking, where will that lead me eventually, right? And without Christ to to correct us, to course correct us, we can oftentimes find ourselves in some strange places or some rough places and all those different things that you mentioned leading unto bondage. But the good news is that God breaks that, right? He breaks those chains, which is huge. And it is why, one of the reasons that we uh, willfully surrender to him, right? Um, so let's dig into the word here. First 11 uh, verses we'll cover first. Um, again, Paul has just made a point that the much more grace of God abounds over sin. That's what we. That's where we pick this up here. Um, but let's pray, and we're going to dig in through these first eleven verses. Father, we ask for your anointing on this message. Lord, may your words ring true to people's hearts. May my words fall away, and uh, may we receive everything that you have for us this morning, for our families, for our marriages, for ourselves for our careers, our jobs, our friendships, our, our community, Lord, we, for our church as a whole. Speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1, chapter 6. What shall we say then? Remember, he just said, when sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So what, oh, if sin abounds, grace can abound? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were, as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, and knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of what? Sin. For he who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our, Lo our Lord. So uh, he, go, going back to, to verse 1 there, he's, like, he's, he's making this analogy. And again, he says like, hey, well, sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And there were literally churches that were popping up the church in Corinth seemed to be along those lines of like, hey, well, that means if we have extra more sin, we get extra more grace. So like, you know, let's, let's multiply grace by multiplying sin, which is bizarre, <laughs> um, you know. And we could almost apply it to today. Like it's that person that may, might make an excuse like, oh, well, you know, God forgives me. Now. No big deal. Like, right? Like, you know. I, I'll pray afterwards. I'll ask God to forgive me, and I'll be good to go. Careful, right? Certainly not. He says, like, what shall we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's like, no way. No. No, because that's dumb. That's what he would said there. <laughs> um, and then he goes into this analogy here, right, that he talks about water baptism. He says, hey, you know, we were baptized into the death of Christ, right? We were baptized into his death, and, and baptism, as it, as it were, of course, represents what? Hmm? It, it bury, it, yeah, the, the dying to self. And then, of course, you come up out of the water, you're the rebirth, like you mentioned, right? It's both. And so he's, he's, he's drawing that analogy there. He's saying, hey, look, guys, remember, we were baptized into his death, right? 
It's a sign of dying to self and then being born again, right? Being born again. And he talks about that old man in verse 6. He says that old man was crucified with him. What is, what's that old man, church, as you guys know? Hmm? Uh, <laughs> our flesh, that old sinful flesh of us, that old, the old you, right? That's what it's talking about. The whole point is that when we come, when we say yes to Jesus, there should be a newness that happens. It should be like a light switch, right? Now there's some working out and some sanctification that happens, but there should be some fruit, right? There should be evidences of it. And he's saying here, he's like, look, you don't continue in sin. He's like, yes, you will mess up. You're not expected to be perfect. However, you shouldn't continue and walk in sin. The old you is dead. You were baptized into his death. And the old man, verse six, your old man was crucified with him. It's dead. It's done, right? When we come to Christ, we repent, we turn from our sin, we acknowledge that we have specific wrongs and have wronged a holy God, right? And we reckon, we judge them as dead in the past, verse 11, right? Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. You see? We need to reckon that as like, no, we're not going there. We're not going to go there. That's the old me. The old me would have done that. The old me would have said that. The old me would have thought that. The old me would have felt that and just gone with it. We need to, to be growing with him. Like, consider, reckon that dead. Judge that as, no, you know what? No, not going there. Not going there, right? Now, I'm not talking about relying on your own strength because we also, of course, need the strength of the Father, the strength of God to be able to do this. But we need to purpose it Right? Does that make sense? We don't make it. Paul's addressing that person that might make an excuse and go, ah, you know, God forgives me. There's, there's a, we have a problem in, in, in the church. There's a lot of just weak, milk toast, like church, churches and like Christians. And I'm not trying to beat up on people. And I won't name any places of people, but the reality is, is we need to really like get down to it, man. Like, what is it? What is it to follow God? Like, what does that look like? Right? Thank you. <laughs> I agree. And this is, this is for me, too. Like, you know, what, what am I allowing into my life? What, what you know, I, or what am I not doing? Or it's, it's a whole, the whole stuff, right? We've, we need to reckon ourselves as dead, the old, the old nasty you. <laughs> which is still clinging to us, right? That's the crazy thing. Like we're born again and like we're saved and redeemed and yet there's that part of us and he's actually going to get into that here in chapter 7 and chapter 8 as he's getting into this like, oh, I feel that pull and the old me wants to come down off the cross and resurrect. And he's like, no, we need to reckon that dead. And that's kind of, there's a, there's a battle, right? There's a battle. That's why you, you, your knee-jerk reaction when you're caught guilty, like there's a tendency that you might like, you want to just, minimize the, the wrong or lie possibly, right? Or avoid the truth. And that's it. I get that. So we need to be dead to sin. And what does it say though in, in the end of verse 11? Alive to Christ, right? Alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is calling us into life, right? He's calling us into life. But you can't have life if you're walking in sin, right? The old ways need to be reckoned as being dead. We need to take action. If there's something in your mind right now, even so Holy Spirit is good, like right? He's good at like pointing out something. And if you've got something and God is talking, like and immediately when I said it, like when I'm talking about this stuff, you're like, ooh, that was probably God talking to you, gave you a little, you know, a little target, says, bink, there it is, and this, you know, a little flashing dot on the radar, right? It's like, that's it. Deal with this, deal with this. Make a note right now, a mental note or jot it down or come back on that, you know, talk to them right now. We need to take action, okay? Because if they're, let me, let me say this here too. Not, I don't mean to burden you here, but let's just, here's the thing. 
if there hasn't been true change from your old self, if you look about the same as you did when you said yes to God, and, if it, and, it's, not yes, if it, and it's not yesterday that you got saved, right? Then I, are you? Are you? I don't know. If there's no change at all in, in what you, how you think and speak and feel and act and all those things, if, you have, if there hasn't been something that God is working out of you and into you, if there's nothing like that, then what's going on? Is there, is it, or is it just that there's, hey, there's some compromise? I'm not picking on anybody individual, but I'm saying we need to have a healthy, uh, spirit, take a spiritual inventory, right? We need to. Well, the, I guess we don't. I mean, the alternative is we don't, and then we just look like a mess, you know, into the world. Like, the world is look, look at that and go, oh, you're a Christian? That's the scariest thing. Isn't that this, those would be like the scariest, one of the scariest words. Like, you're out and about, and someone goes, oh, you're a Christian? I didn't even know. Like, this whole time, like, we worked together for five years. I didn't even realize you were a Christian. It means you don't talk about it, you don't live it. There's nothing like, in your character that seems, to, oh, my gosh. Right? We need to be open with it, with that, and growing, and all that stuff. So, um, and but here's the thing: your past, your past does not have power over you. There's baggage. I get that, and there's some working through stuff, right? But the old you is dead, and dead things don't live. They don't have power. That's they're in. They're dead. They're done, right? So Paul's talking about. It. He's like, be done. Be done with that. It doesn't. Don't go there. Don't go to the past. Don't go to that old way of, of, of living and thinking and acting, right? The past, you may have been addicted before. God has set you free. Who are you in Christ is far greater than who you were. Yeah, but I did this and I did that. And it's like, that's done. That was dealt with on the cross. It's done. Clean slate, guys. We need to walk it. That's the old you. That's dead. That's done. That's buried. I'm with Christ. I'm born again. His grace, oh, thank you, God. Amen to that? That's huge. Dead to sin, alive to God. That's what we're talking about here. Um, and like I said here, you know, don't resurrect that old you. <laughs> it's all there, isn't it? I guarantee you, we go a little long on this message, we'll start to see a little bit of that old you coming up because you'll be hungry. And you're like, oh, when's he going to finish up and start to get a little grumpy, right? If you, miss, if, you lose, if you lose some sleep, heaven forbid you lose some sleep, you'd be tired and hungry, right? <laughs> you know, and then there's a little conflict here with the spouse, <laughs> a little something that happens, right? Or you bang your toe, you know, and then all of a sudden certain words might come out that wouldn't have normally if you were in a different place, right? So there's a part of us that, like, like that old you is still in there bouncing around. And so that's why, Lord, keep me in your spirit. Lord, teach me how to walk in truth and love and, and righteousness, right? Help me to do that. Empower me to do that. I can't do it without you, right? Help me to let go of this and let go of that. So what does it mean to be alive in Christ? It's, it mentions that right here, right? Verse 11, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. doesn't mean that we won't sin. It just means that we need to purpose it. We need to put forth effort, right? But then it says that we would be alive to God in Christ Jesus. What does that mean to be alive in Christ? Okay. Empowerment from him. Growth and fruit, such as? Spiritual gifts, right? Yeah, there you go. See, uh, boom, there's a bunch of them right there. Peace, joy, Long, being long-suffering, you, you should have more patience with people. Emily? Spirit-led. Spirit -led. What does that mean, spirit-led? Yeah, being led by the Spirit in a moment-by-moment. -moment. Does that mean, like, like, we go into a trance? We just kind of like we're led by the Spirit. Is that what the, is that what's happening here? No, we're we're talking about a sensitivity to that oftentimes still small voice, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. We're like, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that, or I should do that. 
I, I, you know what? I think I need to offer this to this person. I need to, I need to go, I need to do this thing. Does that make sense, guys? Being led. Sometimes it's an argument. Sometimes there's a conflict with a friend or a relationship. You're like, I should not have said that. You know, I need to, I need to reconcile. I need to make that right. I need to go back. I need to ask for forgiveness. Right? Rita. Yeah. yeah. Is anybody here perfect? Who's here? Who's here is perfect? Jeremy? Okay. Yeah, Chris. Okay, good. We aspire. We aspire to. Re <laughs> if none of us are perfect, then we all have work to be done in us, and God is very interested in in cultivating that, right? He's and, and the Holy Spirit is alive and powerful and well and lead us into truth and all those different things, and so like don't freak. Hence, have grace on one another, <laughs> have grace on me, you know? We, we need to extend that grace to each other for them to be being worked on, right? Um, there's another one more, yeah, Raphael. If there's moral confusion being led to this, you understand how God, you know, had grace on your life, so now you're handling it in this way with that person. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, you're alive in Christ, you're more forgiving, more nurturing, more compassionate, maybe, empathetic. Yeah, yeah. The way you worship, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> when God's doing something major in your life, you guys ever had this? He's doing, he's digging, he's digging something out, and you really kind of, you kind of meet this. You, there's this moment in a song that might, in your, in, like he's been, it, it just, it just hits you harder. You're like, I've sang that thing. 20 times, but all of a sudden it's just like this one's it's just like a oh, and it just you and you can feel this well a release. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had that. Yeah, yeah, there we go. There we go. You and me, man. <laughs> There's no, one more. Yeah, um, well, kind of on the on the examination stuff, where you expect the more alive in Christ you are, the more opposition you get to it in the spiritual sense and in the, in the worldly sense, but you're empowered to. Right, right, yeah. Uh, being alive in Christ typically means you're going to have a little more warfare. Put it that way, right? There is a battle, <laughs> and the battle is is for you to not for a, for a human being to not come to Christ. First off, right, to be in bondage, to be chained to that old man, right. And then if they, a person does come to Christ, the the battle and the warfare is is to 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 extinguish the flame or get it to just to be. Well, Jesus says, you know, talks about put, don't, you don't put your light under a, a basket, right? You know, it, it, covering it. And the enemy wants you to do that. Tone it down. Oh, don't be judgy. Don't talk. Ooh, this act, that's going to offend people, blah, blah, blah. And just, right? And so there is a battle. There is a battle on those things. Absolutely. So. All right. So talk about, we're going to talk about taking ownership and responsibility. This is a fun one, right? Ownership and responsibility. Hmm. Uh, verse, verse 12 here. Let's pick it up here. Be dead, reckon yourself to be dead to sin, alive to God. Therefore, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Do not present your members, your body, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. I love, love, love this section. <laughs> it's so encouraging to me. And um, it's so needed, right? Your members, of course, is your body and your mind. They're in verse 13. Um, bottom line, we're either going to uh, willfully submit ourselves or obey our lusts. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a, a natural knee-jerk. That's what you're like, a lot of times, your reactions, right? Um, you know, or, or so we either we're going to give in to those thoughts or emotions and, and lusts or whatever those things are, the pull, and serve those things, or... We're going to take our thoughts captive and our emotions captive and realize that just because you feel it doesn't make it true. Fun fact, it doesn't, right? 
uh, facts versus feelings. Um, and instead, we are supposed to present our instruments, our body and our mind, as instruments of righteousness, right? That's super important. There's no third option. Either you're going to pursue the flesh or you're going to pursue the spirit, right? You're either going to follow darkness or you're going to follow the light. There's no middle thing there. It's, it's, it's one or the other, right? And I love how he says here, he's like, so he's encouraging. He said, like, hey, look, don't let sin reign. It can end up reigning. Is, is he writing to non-believers or, or believers? He's writing to believers. So even as a born-again Christian, you can end up letting sin reign again in your life. If we're not vigilant, if we're not engaging in the battle, if we're not being wise, we're not feeding our spirit, we will give our flesh gets stronger, right? Again, he's going to circle back on this next chapter, but um, next two chapters. <clears throat> he's saying, look, don't let sin reign. Don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Instead, they need to be instruments of righteousness. Verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. Dominion, rule, right? Sin will not rule over you. You don't have to go there. There was a point when you may have had to go there physically, meaning like you were, you were chained to your sin, but that's done now. Now there's freedom found in Christ. We're no longer under the law, which ultimately shows us how dirty, rotten we are. Instead, we're under grace, which is newness of life, which is victory over sin, which is going to be all the things that, like the hope that comes with that. And Paul is saying, hey, look, as you take ownership and responsibility in these areas of your life and you're talking to me through this and I'm walking through your, this, this tough battle and this walk, and he goes, I'm right with you through this struggle. But church, we need to recognize the battle. We need to recognize what's in us and take responsibility for these things and, be, and take action to cut this stuff out as he leads us, right? So really, it's just be vigilant, right? Identify sin, compromise in your life, right? Identify it. The good news is, like, too, like, um, like, as you grow and you're listening to God and you're reading your word and you're in prayer and you're in fellowship, right, and you're talking with people and you've got good, you've surrounded yourself with a good community where people can talk to you and get to know you. And, like, there's just, that's where, like, life happens, right? And as people start to get closer to you, <laughs> this can often ha times happen where you're like, they might mention something. You're like, oh, you know what? I've seen you, you know, this kind of, because you're, you're closer, right? And it's always the people that are closer to you, closest to you that know you more than, you know, others, right? And so they might mention something, and I think we can encourage each other along the way. And so, I, you know, not that we need to always be pointing fingers, this is where you're wrong. We're not, not going there. But as a, as a loving friend, we address a, a brother that may be in sin or just, you know, going off the track or something like that. And, and real men, it's out of love that we do that. But we, that, that's kind of what we're talking about. So that sin doesn't have dominion over somebody else, if that makes sense. So being vigilant and uh, having a team mindset, right? Does that make sense? You know, so as you're just talking, like, who, who do you pour into? Kind of, we'll say it that way. Like, who do you pour into? Who can you speak into? And, or who can speak into you? Who speaks into your character, right? That's why I love the women's group and the men's group. I mean, I, I don't go to the women's group. Um, <laughs> I love it. It's great. Um, but the, the, the women's group and the men's group, they're designed, especially at this point, to have an element of that accountability, transparency. People can speak into each other's situations and life and pray together and have that closeness. And that's like what God's designed us for that. You know, and that's part of that being vigilant and just identifying like what needs or just what to do. I mean, take sin and compromise off the table. Like what to do? Like what? What's the best course to, to take? You know, I remember praying for you guys. You know, in the men's group, and, and then you know Brian came in. He's like, "Look, God answered that prayer." He's like, "This is yeah, God's good." You know, it's, it's just neat to see that, right? And then we get we get to see God move in these new ways, and as we take ownership and responsibility, and then really we, acts so this way. Oh, this is what I was going to get to, too. I got sidetracked. But as we're walking with God, I found that, yeah, I still make mistakes, but my reset time is faster. Does that make sense? Even in my marriage, we used to, we, man, we used to spin 
on that conflict, we would we would go weeks. Like we would go weeks just at each or or stonewall, and every little thing is, and then, and then we just snarl at each other some more, and then we leave. You know, right? What it just it was just, and we would just feel justified, and we'd go we'd go retreat, and we'd, oh this is why, and this oh and they'd do something, you're like oh yep yep that's why, that's why you're doing it again. We'd, we'd see each other. It was a mess, right? This is as believers. Now. Emily's perfect. I have a little bit more work to do. <laughs> Just being quicker to course correct, man. Like we might, we might go, you know, a couple hours with with an issue or something. Even then, anymore, it seems like we're just kind of in step, you know, and still messing up. But it's like, do we need to spin? Do we need to spin on this? Do we? It's it's exhausting to go that route. <laughs> let's just let's let's move forward. Let's agree. I'm sorry. I, yeah, it's okay. Hug your little, little makeup, you know, all that good stuff, right? In the same way, church. Sometimes we, as we as we're walking with God, like I said, we're not going to instantly become perfect. Doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes. In some ways, yes, but then your 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 turnaround time is going to be way faster, right? If you're if you're prone to like depression and anxiety, those getting out of that should be faster. It should be it should be shorter and shorter times. Okay, or you start to recognize, ooh, I'm starting to go that route. I need to reel that in. I need to hit the word. I need, I, you know, you just have to be sensitive to where you are, where you're feeling weak. Does that make sense, guys? And so that's part of that taking ownership and responsibility and just surrendering ourselves to Christ. It's not your own strength. It's surrendering to Him. And then ultimately, it's like learning to walk in that freedom. Like that's the good news. You can have mastery over your, over, over your flesh. You're, you're not. You're designed to do that. Like God's like, hey, I'll help you to do that. That's, that's good news. <laughs> that's absolutely good news. We're, you know, sin shall not have dominion over you. I'm just, you know, it's just the way I am. My dad was like that. No, stop. That may be true that he was, no, or she was, that no, that no longer. Sin will, look, that's a promise. Sin shall not have dominion over you. There is no power that sin has over you anymore. It's reckoned dead when you said yes to Jesus, when you were baptized, you, you're dead to sin. That's a symbolic aspect of it, right? You're born again. Newness. You're no longer under the law. You're under grace, which I've said before. That's the one thing that is unique to Christianity. Unlike any other religion, any other philosophy, this concept of grace. <clears throat> so you're either going to serve Flesh, you're going to serve sin because that's what happens. You end up compromise, eventually you get chained to it, or you're going to serve the Lord. What are some things that people may serve or become enslaved to? So specifically the negative side of that, what are some things that people may serve or are enslaved to? Ego. Football. Ooh, man, gee, that's way too personal with opening day coming up here. Come on, man. I'm going to the Vols game on Thursday. I'm excited about it. Anyway. I'm not enslaved to it. <laughs> I can quit anytime I want. Let's go to one thing. Yeah. Money. Money. Uh, enslaved to doing. Hmm. Interesting. Identity. Hmm? Identity. Identity. Yeah. Fear. Fear. Depression. Oof. Depression. Anxiety. That could, that's enslaving, isn't it? Drugs, substances, food. Be addicted to food, absolutely. Appearance, right? You know, appearance. That person in the gym looking at himself in the mirror while he's listening to motivational tapes that he recorded for himself while he works on himself and stares at himself and listens to himself. <laughs> I'm working on it. What else? Self-preservation. Self-preservation. Like, 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 prolonging of everything. And it's like, I'm, at your best efforts, you're still, at, even with your best efforts, 10 out of 10 pass. <laughs> There's one more, I think. Yeah. Slothfulness, laziness, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
ooh, yeah, we can become enslaved to, to kids, they were saying. Yeah, because if you if you if the children are on the pet on the altar, you know, are on, are on the throne, you know, then you worship them. Yeah, that can happen, right? And we Oh gosh, why did you go there? <laughs> Social media. You ever you ever had your phone out? All of a sudden you're like, oh, that why I just went ahead and just opened up Instagram. What happened there? Has anybody ever done that? Just like just out of like rote habit? Just me? I'm just the one? Okay. You know? You know, Twitter, whatever, whichever one, you know, TikTok or whatever. And so you're just going through and you're like, all of a sudden you're or you're like, dude, I've been I've been scrolling for 15, 20 minutes. And what the heck? I was supposed to just check an email. <laughs> I got a notification on my my phone, and all of a sudden here I am on social media. You know, you're like, well, how did I get out of that habit? You know? We become enslaved to it. Yeah. <laughs> There's something over here that oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Gossip, absolutely. Oh my gosh. Did you hear? Did you did you hear about this? Blah blah blah. Oh, oh, oh. And because it's it's tasty morsels, isn't it? Sometimes that's part of the addiction of social media is because there's little tasty morsels and they because the news and all these articles and stuff, they know that people want to oh, what's going on? What what did Biden do next? Oh my gosh. Oh, did you know? Oh, yeah, they, oh, yeah, they're bad. Oh, they're good. You know, it's just like we just want we crave all of that. And it's like there's and we want it's like we want to know that everybody else, it, it's always the fault. It's the gossip isn't like, hey, isn't that awesome that this and this happened for them? Isn't that amazing? That's great. <laughs> gossip is that, is that bad stuff, right? And we want to always paint, look how bad all these other people are. I'm not like that, right? It just makes you feel better. It's just nonsense. Anyway, that's a good one. Self-deceit. Self yeah, self-deceit. Yeah, sometimes people get just the pursuit of just knowledge, gaining knowledge, you know, gaining knowledge. Oh, some of, some of these things can be a good thing, not so much the the sins that we mentioned are not, but the so like knowledge, for example, that's a good thing. Like the alternative is to not grow in knowledge. Like that's weird, right? So like some of these things are good, like having kids and being focused, like making sure that we take care of kids, making sure that we take care of ourselves, and that's good. But when we become enslaved to them because we're serving it, and now we are giving our time and our energy and our thoughts and our emotions and our wallets to these things, or to self, really, because a lot of these things are we're just we're end up worshiping ourselves. We become slaves to these things. But Paul is saying, hey, look, church, you don't. Sin does not have dominion over you, so don't go back to that old way of living and acting. You are born again. There's some, you're, you are wired differently now. You need to be fueled differently and walk in newness of life. All right, last section, <clears throat> verse 15 here. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? It's kind of a natural question there. He's like, so what's the big deal? Like, we're under grace. It's all paid for on the cross. He says, certainly not. No way. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became, in a way, slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. So Paul's even acknowledging, he's like, look, it's kind of a weird example there with this whole slave thing. He's like, but you can understand. He's like, I'm just speaking in human terms, right? <clears throat> either a slave of sin or a, a slave of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to the righteousness. He's like, what he's saying there, he's like, when you were slaves to sin and you didn't, you didn't, you didn't think about righteousness. <laughs> that was not on your radar, you know. It's like you didn't care about that. You know, in a way, you're kind of like free from it. Like that's not even a thing you cared, concerned yourself with. 
Like before Jesus, I didn't care about doing, you know, all these different things, right? Yeah, right, yeah. But he is mentioning here too, though, that the it's it's as though we are now slaves to, to Christ, you know, because we serve him. We'll call, we'll talk about the whole slave thing here in a second, though. Um, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. And he and he quotes here or it continues here. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. You think about the fruit that you that was produced in all of your like just our past, the junk. There was some nasty fruit I made. It was gross. It was rotten. Nobody, you know, ugh, right? <laughs> He's like, it's a you're kind of it's a it's a shame. I'm ashamed of some of the things I've done, and the hurts that I've caused, and the, 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 the there's just in the wake of sin is just tragedy and brokenness and despair and all that just junk, right? That's what Paul's talking about. He says, but now, verse 22, now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, interesting terminology, you have your fruit to what, church? What's it say? Holiness. Ooh. Now we're bearing different fruit. And this fruit is good <laughs> when it's born of the Spirit, right? And the end of that is everlasting life. But look at the two comparisons. It's like sin, 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 never, never, not accepting Christ, right? Boom, just, just a slave to it. The end of that is death and hell, ultimately, right? Yes to Jesus, it's by grace, walking with him, working things out, and at the end of that is everlasting life with him in heaven. Awesome, right? Two different things. Verse 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen to that, right? Um, by the way, this word slave here is doulos, which is a person who's under someone else's authority um, and will, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a submission to a person's uh, authority and will. So are we submitting our authority and will to sin? Right? Or are we submitting our authority and um, are we submitting ourselves under the authority and will uh, of God? Right? Are we are we submitting? Which way are we doing that? Right? Um, and side note here, permit me just to kind of go here. There's a lot of skeptics will will point out, say, hey, one of the reasons that the Bible is a bunch of junk is because it talks about slavery. And you've heard that that's this argument before, right? It's oh, slavery in the Bible, and it says it's okay, and, and so like that, that, that. Um, and the issue of slavery in the Bible is one that a skeptic may present, right, um, as supposed evidence, you know, that the Bible's not true. Um, and while there have been indeed like like really some like horrible abuses throughout history of ens enslaving people and forcing uh, them to be in bondage and you know stripping them of the humanity, this is not what. God instituted, right? God didn't institute that. Um, he did allow for like a form of, we could say, slavery in the sense that like servitude, right? Um, people were to be provided by their master. And so what would happen is like you'd be working and let's say you're a farmer and there's like a couple years of drought and you're like, I have no money. Like this is how I made money. And then it's like, okay, well, I'll work for you. Like my, my, I'll bring my family under your authority and will, and we'll be yours to work your fields, and or to, maybe it's to, you know, we're gonna go. I'm gonna turn become a fisherman for you, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll work for you. What is it you have for me? I'll take care of this in your household, whatever that is. And and then there was, and, and if you remember correctly, um, God would say there was, there was the year of jubilee. You guys remember that, right? And there's also every every seventh year you're supposed to just let, you, you let people go, right? And so there was there was a there was a way out of it. It's like hey, the debt's forgiven, kind of type thing. And like prop, people's property, you have to sell all your property. And so it was, it was a way for people to be provided for, even when they had literally nothing, like nothing, completely drained. Um, so it's a little bit different, right? Um, then you know when we when we think slavery, we're thinking something you know, very different um, to that, like people walk in, in chains and you know burdens and stuff like that. These, uh, these people were to be treated fairly. They, were, they could even be redeemed for their freedom, right? So people could actually, it was, you, you could have a kinsman redeemer. The, the whole book of Esther talks about this, by the way. And so they would, you, could, you could do that. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, book of Esther, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The book of Ruth. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, there, there's that, right? Uh, they're, they were to, they have their freedoms reinstated, but, um, you know, there's strong language that Paul's using here, right? He's, there, he did choose that, though. And he's saying in the same way that you become enslaved to this sin, like you, like you have, you've given your will over to this, Right, this way of thinking, whether that be so, you know, you've given over, you've given yourself over to that. He's like in that same way, be, give give yourself wholly over to God, right? You know, like you think about the amazing people that we that we read about throughout history that have like pursued God to no end and just a hundred percent in. Like, are are we a hundred percent in? You know, are you a hundred percent a hundred percent in? Like, oh, no, I 100% believe. Okay, I get that. But your commitment level, your engaging level, like, are you 100% in? What, does that, what would that look like if you were 100% in? Like your life depended on it kind of type thing, right? You know? Like, that's what Paul's kind of talking about here. He's like, are you, are you a slave to self, a slave to your sin, or are you a slave to God? Right? We can think we're free without Christ. You know, I, I thought, as a non-believer, I thought I was fine. I thought I was free. You know, I thought, why do I need Jesus for, right? But really, I was a slave, and I didn't realize it until I tried to make changes. And I realized, oh, dang. I, I can't stop this behavior of mine, you know? I had an issue with, with deception, you know? lying to people and just manipulating and stuff like that. Don't judge me. Okay. Just being transparent. It's pre-Jesus. Okay. But at the, but, and, and this, where it says that the wages of sin is death, I experienced that. And that was, a, that was a verse that always hit me when I first was entertaining the thought of who this Jesus is and salvation and all that. Right? Because remember, I wasn't, wasn't raised a Christian. This was, this was years down, right, down the road. The wages of sin is death. And I'm like, the wages of sin? That means what that's saying is that what you earn because of your sin, like you work at it, you, you sin, you worked at that, well, you just produce death. Here's your payment. Just Here you go. Here's your paycheck. Death, pain, anxiety, suffering, emptiness, wrongdoing, shame, right? The wages of sin is death. <laughs> but as Christ's servant, as we... If we serve those things, it's just bleh, muck, grossness, yucky, rotten fruit, right? That's the old stuff. We are to be set free. We are to serve Christ. And as Christ's slave or his servant, his doulos, right, we bear new fruit, and that fruit is holiness, life, right? The gift of God is eternal life. It's awesome. Game changer, right? Game changer. And it's not based on your ability, it's not based on your ability, right? It's God's power, God working in you. Yeah. Just with note that Paul also identified being a son. He starts the letter, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Who even you serve to? I mean, that's so ingrained in who he was. Like you said, he's hundred percent in. And, and that's yeah. And that's exactly. It. You're you're designed as human beings. We're designed to serve something. We are. We're designed to serve something. Either you're going to serve self, you're going to serve sin, you're going to serve an ideology that exalts itself against God, or you're going to serve the Lord. And really, who are you going to serve today, right? You know, choose for yourself who you'll serve, right? That's why me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, Right? There's a purposing of that happens there, and so there's there's a need for us to choose and ask you know that question that's on the screen right there. Well, who will you serve today? Right? It's not a once for all necessarily. Meaning that you can say yes to Jesus and then you know stray. Right? It's a it, these are like daily decisions that you have to make moment by moment, really. Right? You know. So there's a choice. Either are you serving yourself 
or serving these ideologies or what these other ways of thinking, or are you serving the Lord? And so we need to firmly commit to righteousness, firmly commit to it, right? And really, you, you can't say yes, Jesus, and no, Jesus, and no, Jesus, right? You can't say, oh, yeah, I love the Lord, love it, love it. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to, I don't want to do those things, Lord. That's, no, that's not me. That's for someone else. Those aren't my giftings. I'm not wired that way, right? We can't, there should be no no to Jesus. It's yes, Lord. That's what Lord means. Lord means boss, right? He's the, our master. The slave doesn't have any more rights. When you've surrendered to Christ, it's truly like, yes, Lord. Yes, boss. You want me to go where? You got it. You want me to do what? All right. I don't feel comfortable about it. It's not about you. <laughs> yeah, but I don't want to do it. Doesn't matter. <laughs> you know? Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You don't, you matter to him. You have value. But your feelings, no, guys. We need to trust the Lord. We need to walk with him. Is, it, is this making sense? I hope. <laughs> you can't say yes to him and no to him at the same time. It's either, you're either all in, you're either a slave to God or a slave to the world, man. You know, where's your hope? My hope's in the Lord. Because this world sure doesn't look like it has a lot of hope, right? Because we're meant for holiness. Now, again, we're not going to be perfect. I get that. Don't think that, right? I don't, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, oh, you messed up, you dirty, rotten sinner. Yeah, we've, we're all that way, Okay. But it's just knowing that we're pursuing righteousness, right? Submit yourselves, your instruments, your, your, your uh, what's the word he used? Present your members as instruments of righteousness. Like be mindful, like go that direction. Pursue that, right? Don't just drift. Don't settle for the status quo. Yeah, that's a good, good middle ground there. Just, I can just... It's, Good enough, you know. You're designed to serve and worship something, like I said, right? We're designed to do that. So be mindful of some things that you may be inadvertently serving and surrendering to. Be mindful of that. Listen, talk to God about it. Lord, is there anything in my life? Bob, you were praying earlier. You said, Lord, search me and know me. And if there's anything wicked in me, we were praying over that this morning, right? That was cool. It was Psalm 1, 139, right? Lord, search me and know me. God knows, right? If there's anything wicked in me, like, let's, let's just reveal it, right? Like, just put, put your finger on it. Okay, you know what, Lord? I, I was, like, forgive me. And if God points it up, just, Lord, forgive me. Work, help me to work, in, uh, that, work that out of me. I hope that if you look, if you've been saved for any length of time, I hope if you look back a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, that things look different. And I don't mean being conformed, because we can also end up going into a conformity within the Christian mold. And you speak Christianese and you wear certain things, and, and, you know, like, oh, I have a cross on this, or I'm wearing, my, I'm wearing this or that. I'm not talking about conformity, I'm talking about transformation. The Bible doesn't talk about being conformed, aside from warning us to not be conformed to the world, to mold. It says to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, right? So like we should have, our, we should have new thinking and new feeling and new acting as Christ is alive in us, right? Because we're designed as to, it, it, well, ultimately you become that which you serve. So if you're serving and following God, you're surrendered to him, you're going to look different and you're going to look more like Christ. Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to walk on water, <laughs> but you should. There should be elements where people, church, you might be the only Jesus that someone meets. Like you might be the Christ to them, meaning that you're presenting who He is. You're representing who He is, right? You're ambassador. The Bible talks about that. That we're ambassadors. For Christ. It means an ambassador represents the country, right? The United States ambassador. We represent the, represent the nation that they, right? We're representing the kingdom of heaven. That's, so when you're talking to your spouse in public, 
or your kids in public, or in private, wherever you are, right, your neighborhood, how you treat one another, okay? You're an ambassador, right? Represent well. And I hope that as you're walking with him that you, people can see Christ in you, right? Because we become that which we serve. Watch what happens. If you just sit and watch news all day, you're going to become a different, you're going to think differently, aren't you? Right? You're going to be filled a little more like, uh, uh, right? <laughs> serving sin produces death. Serving God produces life. So we need to choose wisely whom or what we serve. Be smart about it. And it's, it's, it's a daily act of submission. Sometimes you got to re-hit that again as, you know, halfway through the day or something. Lord, Help me to keep mindful of what you have for me, right? Help me to stay focused on what's most important. These are things that you need to, that we all that we all need to do. That's what Paul's talking about here. He's like, hey, that sin's not going to have any more dominion over you, and you need to choose who you're serving here and stay the course, stay firmly planted with the Lord. Amen.